During World War I, millions of soldiers faced the brutality of mechanised warfare. From relentless artillery strikes, constant machine gun fire, and the horrors of burns caused by all manner of combat, the men on the front lines were often left with horrendous injuries. But the sheer number of people left with such injuries pushed the development of plastic surgery to restore both form and function to those affected. In today's video, we will look at a brief history of prosthetics and surgery, how the First World War shaped its development, and examples of what was achieved. It is perhaps helpful to start with just how plastic surgery and prosthetics as we know them today came to be. One of the earliest examples of prosthetic body parts can be traced back to ancient Egypt some 3,000 years ago. A noble woman used a prosthetic toe to enable her to wear sandals. During the 6th century BCE, an Indian physician by the name of Sushruta wrote one of the first collections of medical procedures. The Sushruta Samhita described over 1,000 diseases, various cures, and for the purposes of this video, a number of reconstructive surgeries. These surgeries included skin grafts and ways to reconstruct the nose. A skin graft involves transplanting areas of healthy skin from one part of the body to a part that has been damaged. Sushruta's procedure for reconstructing a nose involved using a flap of forehead skin being brought down to create a nose. This method would be used for some time. During the Middle Ages, it was not uncommon for knights and nobles to incorporate prosthetic limbs into their armour to disguise a previous injury. Whilst these were not functional, it was a way to deal with the societal shame of having such injuries. Advances in the use of prosthetics can largely be attributed to the 16th century French barber surgeon, Ambroise Paris. His role in better battlefield medicine would lead to identifying antiseptic properties in a number of treatments. This led to a greater survival rate and a stepping away from just cauterizing wounds. He introduced the implementation of teeth, artificial limbs and artificial eyes and invented many scientific instruments. He noted that those given artificial limbs were less likely to take their own lives, something many would rather do than live following amputation. The limbs produced by Paris would be functional and based on human anatomy. Perhaps his greatest design was a mechanical hand that simulated the joints of a human hand. His renown was such that he was appointed to serve four kings. Paris' designs would inspire a number of surgeons and engineers to design a number of new prosthetics. From Peter Verdun to James Potts, designs improved not only to be more functional, but also to be more aesthetically pleasing. But the driving force for the needs of such prosthetics went along with improvements in medicine. As more people survived the injuries of war, and as better anaesthetics allowed for longer surgeries, more people left the battlefield alive, but missing limbs. But no war would result in so many injured than the First World War. Most injuries caused through battle were attributed to small firearms and stab wounds. The First World War, however, would be the first major conflict between developed nations using industrial warfare. The total mobilization of man and machine led to an intensity of warfare never seen before. From relentless artillery barrages and machine gun fire, to deadly machines of war such as planes and tanks, many millions were left dead and tens of millions left injured. For surgeons used to dealing with small arms fire and bayonet wounds, these injuries caused by such warfare was just on another level. Field hospitals and hospitals back in the soldiers' home countries were filled with the gravely injured. Many left without limbs as could be expected in war, but thousands were left with severe facial injuries. The nature of trench warfare left bodies well protected, but heads above the parapet presented a tempting target. Debris and shell fragments flying at great speeds caused huge damage to soldiers' heads and faces. At the start of the war, such facial injuries could not be properly dealt with. Surgeons would attempt to stick together the wounds, but this would often result in the patient left with their face contorted. Where eyes, noses and jaws were lost, the soldiers would be left in a sorry state. Such men were not able to recognize themselves and feared returning home. They understood that society would likely shun them for their disfigurement, that their wives and children would struggle to see them, and that they may not be able to find employment. 
It was the New Zealand surgeon Harold Gillies who sought to remedy this situation on a massive scale. He had witnessed firsthand the severe facial injuries affecting many of the soldiers. He returned to Britain and was able to set up a specialised ward for facial injuries in the Cambridge Military Hospital. Soon this would grow into a dedicated hospital for such injuries, known as the Queen's Hospital, located at Frognall House. Gillies pioneered the use of skin grafting for reconstructive surgery on a massive scale. One of the most successful procedures would involve lifting a large flap of a person's healthy skin, what was known as a pedicle. This flap of skin would be located near the wound, or area of the face to be reconstructed. Whilst still being connected to the donor site, the other end of the pedicle would be moved over to the site of the injury, without severing the connection to the body. By maintaining the blood flow, there was a greater chance the body would accept the skin graft. Perhaps the most famous of Gilly's patients was Walter Yeo. Yeo had served on the HMS Warspite during the Battle of Jutland, and operated the guns. It's not exactly clear how he was injured, but he suffered severe cordite burns that left him without eyelids. Yo would be treated by Gillies using this new procedure. Yo is thought to have been one of his first patients to receive this type of surgery. The process would take months and multiple surgeries. It involved a mask of skin being transplanted across Yo's face and eyes, which would also create new eyelids. To recreate Yo's damaged face, Gillies attached this mask via pedicle tubes. In order for the healthy skin to be grafted successfully, Gillies had to remove the scar tissue before attaching the mask, allowing for Yo's face to be rebuilt. The procedure was not without incident, and five days in, Yo developed a serious infection, to the point where the mask was floating on a layer of pus. Thankfully, surgical interventions saved much of the grafted skin. From entering the hospital in November of 1917, it would take many surgeries and almost two years before his discharge in July of 1919. Despite a few instances of corneal ulcers, Yo was able to live until the age of 80, even rejoining the Royal Navy. Gilly's work would continue well up to and past the Second World War. Between the wars, he would travel the world to teach his plastic surgery procedures, as well as establishing his own private practice. During the Second World War, he acted as a consultant to the British Armed Forces. He trained a number of surgeons in his ways to assist those injured in the war. After the Second World War, he went on to work on some of the first sex reassignment surgeries for both males and females establishing the standard practices for such procedures for some time. In addition to surgical treatment, many soldiers would receive all manner of prosthetics to deal with their injuries. With such a large number of injured men, many were concerned about losing a significant proportion of their workforce. Prior to the war, prosthetic limbs had either been prohibitively expensive or purely aesthetic. The real challenge lay in creating practical replacements for joints and fingers. One solution by an Italian orthopaedic doctor named Giuliano Fanghetti led to the creation of a motor flap. The goal was to use the remaining muscle and skin of the amputee stump to operate the prosthetic. In 1915, some 10 years after Fanghetti's early writings, a German surgeon named Ferdinand Saubruck replaced his method. Whether or not this method would be successful would depend largely on what amount of tissue was left following this surgery. Another famous form of prosthetics would involve those who had sustained facial injuries to be given masks. In Britain, it was a sculptor by the name of Francis Derwent Wood that would develop such masks. Serving initially as an orderly, Wood first used his artistic talents to create sophisticated splints for the patients. Though he soon realised that his skills would be more helpful for those who had received serious facial injuries. In March of 1916, he set up his own unit to create masks, usually made from tin or copper. Each mask would be created from a plaster cast of the patient's face. Wood would take the castings and work out how best to rebuild the patient's face, rebuilding areas that had been lost. Once the metal had been worked and the restorative work completed, Wood would paint a unique portrait onto the mask. The patient's skin tone would be matched to create a smooth transition. Wood's work inspired other artists to lend their talents in similar endeavours. 
American sculptor Anna Coleman Ladd contacted Wood, and together, they refined and improved the process. By all accounts, Ladd's masks were more realistic. Ladd would travel to Paris and set up her own production of masks. Often she would include human hair to recreate eyebrows or moustaches. Such masks were often attached to a person's face through glasses. Fans of Broadwalk Empire may recall the character of Richard Harrow, who sported such a mask. Ladd would make around 180 of these masks, though the amount made by Wood is unknown. Whilst all of the 20,000 men who sustained facial injuries did not receive a mask, those who did were given an opportunity to better reintegrate into society and rebuild their shattered sense of self. But for many of those who left the horrors of World War I physically altered, they were seen as other, as different, as lesser. Many of the men struggled to find employment, instead taking up jobs away from the public eye. Gillies played his part in including reskilling some of his patients to find better, meaningful work after the war, but many struggled to reconnect with their families and loved ones. Some would never even leave the hospital, well aware as how they would be treated on the outside world. It is often the case that those who endure the horrors of war will be left broken and irreversibly changed by their experience. In the First World War, it is thought that one in seven of the soldiers returned home with some form of life-changing injury. So too is the case that those affected struggle to reintegrate into civilian life, whether it be because of the psychological or physical injuries they sustained. The work done by the doctors, engineers and artists to help rebuild the men's bodies no doubt helped, though very often, the soldiers were returning to a world that would not accommodate them. Even to this day, those with facial disfigurements are often seen as the villains, perhaps best shown in the James Bond films. The treatment of Walter Yeo would go on to inspire the design of one of the splicer enemies in the Bioshock video game. It must have been hard enough to lose part of oneself in the horrors of war, but to be shunned and seen as lesser on their return would have only compounded the trauma. It is vital we understand how modern plastic and restorative surgeries developed. The men who first undertook and performed these surgeries deserve to be remembered, not as an oddity, but as men who hope to regain what was taken from them, and the people who did what they could to deliver what these men, at the very least, deserved. <laughs>